time. They're all yeah, yelling at each other. At each other. <laughs> We're having an argument oh. about gold. Except hold on, let me go it. get some. Hold on, let me go get some Kleenex. Uh, okay, <laughs> we're good now. <laughs> Why are you crying? Yeah. No. You better get a helmet. <laughs> I'm wiping myself off. Go ahead. Like, not like John Hill. <laughs> oh, God. That's funny. Thank you. Oh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, somebody... it's, it's a very, it's a very hey. subtle sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah hey, hey, Merv, Merv, I'm here to amuse. Am I here to amuse you? <laughs> so, I were, uh, uh, Angelo just started to, he just came in and started to, to we all kind of converged at the same time, which is funny. And Angelo came in and started yelling at people for buying gold up here. <laughs> you know, then we just started talking about how we've been buying gold since the 1200 handle and, and how it was such a big part of my year. And then <laughs> arguing ensued, and here you came perfectly to put it all at ease. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's, well, we, we listen, I, I, I had this long discussion yesterday with a bunch of guys uh, discussing Monday. And again, don't buy the narrative. This is not about inflation. It, I, I, I can't say it more than enough. You guys have heard it from me forever. It's, it's about central banks losing control. And that's what the market's fair for us. I, I don't care anybody because, again, as, as I wrote on Sunday, if you go back and look at 1999 and 2000, when the, when the uh, equity markets were in full rally mode, gold was going the opposite way. Yeah. yeah. Jed, uh, Ira, the other thing I would add to what you just said is that gold also responds to collapsing real yields? Uh, I mean, oh, yeah, no, no question about it. I mean, it's one, but it's one of that same thing. Because so when you when you have collapsing real yields, it's usually uh, central bank uh, aggressiveness that you know in, in trying to get ahead of what, some fear that they have, or lag, or lag. If inflation is starting to rise. But they go, well, we, you know, we don't really see it. It's a one-off event. It's a supply shock. It's just so, I mean, you can get to negative real yields. We have just never been in such a prolonged time of, of negative real yields. Can't argue with that. No, you can't. And, 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 and so what... far, and so far, I mean, I would argue that the Fed at this point um, you know, might not be dovish enough. We'll know in March. Well, I, I, you know, I go back to what I said. There should be, if they really understood, and, and I have to say this, I'm, I'm not pulling any punches. If they understood where this lies, and I know they don't want to cut because if it cuts and the market keeps going down, but this isn't about the stock market right now. This is about the dollar and the dollar rallying here is not going to help this situation because you're going to wind up with a dollar funding crisis and that's going to be deflationary. And the gold absolutely understands that because if you start to, you know, there's so much capacity in the world that if you get a demand shock and the global economy starts to slow down, coupled with a strong dollar, these emerging markets and others, especially the corporations in emerging markets who have borrowed all this dollar denominated debt are going to have a serious problem here. And that's when you get into a deflationary spiral because they're just going to be pushing product out the door, you know, because they got to raise cash. You want to avoid this. And as I say, the Fed could do this very easily. Look it, we're cutting rates 50 basis points. And we're doing it as an emergency measure because we don't know the impact from the coronavirus. If it's not as long lasting as some are saying, we'll pull it back. If you absolutely set policy like that, you'd have a much greater impact because, again, you're putting a, a, you know, a drop dead date to it possibly and going, this is, this is an emergency measure and it would take some of the pressure off the dollar. Yeah, yeah. This the the dollar going up here is is adding to this 
potential. And, and honestly, I think that's because right now for all the, uh, you know, anti-gold people, and I, again, this is not a gold bug discussion. This is a investment discussion. It's not a gold bug. I'm not a gold bug. When things change, as Keynes famously said, I change. Uh, but right now there are things going on and the gold is giving you a pretty good message because it's interesting today that with all of this, the palladium is making all time highs today. You know that palladium is up a hundred, a hundred and seventy four dollars today, and that's with the auto sector shutting down, supposedly. Right? We're going to lose two to three million cars in global auto production, maybe more. That's oh, pal that, palladium is up a hundred, hundred seventy four dollars. Platinum's up twenty dollars. Something is, you know, I'm telling you, uh, Jerome, it's time for you to do a Skype uh, video conference. Yeah, oh, wait, maybe you should go on Slack. Oh, maybe, you, should, you know. <laughs> I have a Zoom. question. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you know, it, I think it might be a good idea to have, just be holding on to some short EM right here. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I, I know. It, it's because I'm looking, I'm looking at the ruble and, the peso, peso is actually holding in uh, fairly well. Again, not sure why, but the, uh, yeah. the the emerging markets are definitely. Look at the news out of Korea. What was the headline? I, I don't have to, and it's not a false headline. It's a real headline. Uh, when the all, Korean, all the Asian Korean, developing countries are in the Chinese, you know, supply chain and pipeline and selling to China and tourism and everything. They need China. Yeah. Oh, yes, especially the supply chain. And more importantly, as uh, I mean, there were some really good uh, blog posts. Mike Temple was really busy. I may as well. He, he wrote a lot. A lot of it was just point that on, you know, you got the Tokyo Olympics in July. Yeah, are they going to have them? That's the question. Can they actually have yeah. people in the country? I, I talked to Toby. Uh, That'd yeah, be a bearish night. headline. Yeah, you're way away from that. There's just, you don't have a, you know, that, that would just be pure sensationalism. But but the news out of South Korea was, uh, what was exactly, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. oh, uh, it was South Korea moon calls current economic situation an emergency. South Korea's moon economic situation is worse than expectation. Uh, you know, so... It's, these are potential uh, areas, again, let's use the right language, demand shock. And if it's a demand shock, with a rising dollar, the Fed cutter is, it has nothing to do with the equity markets. The equity markets can power on, they may power on, they may not power on. This is an issue of the dollar. It's okay, you don't want to cut rates? You know what? They have swap lines already, you know, of course, to certain countries, you know, and that's going back to 2008, 2009, 2010, when they were providing uh, dollar liquidity around the gold. They may have to do this with the emerging markets, but you might get pushback from Congress because, again, this you take on a lot of risk here. Uh, so do you want to take on that global risk or are you just willing to say, hey, we're going to cut rates here? Yeah, and yeah, it's going to... What it'll do is weaken the dollar, but weakening the dollar is not for a trade advantage. It's to prevent a uh, potential financial crisis here. And I say potential. I mean, we're, we're still early in this, but the movement in the dollar has been, you know, fairly dynamic. Uh, uh, and I'm not even talking about the emerging markets. We're up to 99.28, and that's coming off the highs of 99.45 on the dollar index day. I mean, the euro, as we talked last week, the politics out of uh, last month, in fact, a week ago, Monday, when the political news out of Europe was terrible. The Irish news was not good. The news out of Germany, and the news out of Germany, by the way, continues to deteriorate as far as uh, where they're going. So, uh, and the euro is, of course, you know, it's just been weakening in, in response to because what are they doing? And the news, of course, out of Germany today uh, on the um, 
ZFW index or ZEW index uh, was very weak. So there's nothing good. And if this virus really starts to grow, of course, some of the supply chains from China to Europe, so many products going, it, it, it's coming at a very bad time. And they, again, have no answer. And, and you know what? Doing another 30, 30 billion a month in QE, that's not the answer because it's not making a difference now. So uh, they're going to have to go and come up with something else. But the United States could take some of the upper pressure off the dollar, which would alleviate some. So I'm just wait. I'm waiting to hear about it. Ira, the other place where the dollar, the stronger dollar, is definitely having an effect is in the repo market as well. Oh well, um, sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. you know, so so because it, it, there's cash around, um, but the people that want to borrow uh, don't want to pay the higher rates. Uh, you know, the Fed, what what did they say? That they wanted to start phasing out non-QE, what, uh, April, was it? Um, well, if, if this, April 5th, it, after the tax uh, payment day of April 15th, they were going to yeah, send it out. Well, if the dollar just stays here, right? I don't think they're going to be able to pull that off without creating a ruckus. Oh, there's no question. And you're, you're making my case. That's, that's why they need to get out of here. They need to, they need to change the, the thought process of the market right now. They need to, they need to. And if it means that people, you know, uh, would go other places for funding, so be it. But, you got to take, you know, you got to make the, the dollar very unattractive for the moment because it's going to cause havoc only again in relation to the demand shock. I know, I, I know everybody's going to come and go, no, it's not going to, you know what? This is not about the equity market. This is not, and you better damn well steepen those curves, boys. And if you can do it without cutting rates, oh, oh yeah, you could, but, uh, that would take some real great creativity, but very careful here because if this continues on and you get more headlines like out of South Korea and South Korea is an important bellwether for global market and global trade. So, I, you know, when I saw that, I, I, I had a sense. Uh, I actually, I, I, I'll tell you, I was long silver and short gold and I just covered my gold all the way down almost at the bottom when I started seeing some of this and going, ah, and so I actually was, uh, pro I'm out of silver now. I'm just uh, playing with some long gold here, but I'm, I'm watching. It's, we're just back into that area from when was that, January 7th or 8th, when we had the missile strikes and, uh, and we had that one-time spike that night. Yeah, but we're above it. So Yeah. We're... No, no, we, we didn't take out that high, Judge. Well, well, it depends upon if you're looking at April or not. Oh, I, well, let me, you know what, this, I could put up the day of continuation. I know I'm, I'm looking at, uh, put up well, an want, active daily, Ira. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Cause the high in April, the, no, the 17, high in April right? was, yeah, up at, uh, yeah, 16, I mean, 19. And yeah. they 16, 13, 30 on, on the daily. Here's what I'm yeah. looking Hold on a second. Yeah, that's right. I'm on the same chart. Yeah. Uh, okay. Daily continuation. Yep. Yeah, and you're right at the oscillators, uh, oscillator resistance. And the other thing is I just put up the 100 by 3. Yeah. So it's right up into that area, which is, you know, right around 03-ish, 04, 05, somewhere up in there. You know, yeah. and that's such a long-term point and figure that it's, you know, you can't get too tick sensitive with it. Yeah, uh, you know what? It's uh, this. This is just coming at a at a very difficult time, and we're not even again. We're not even talking politics or anything. This is this is just the, the mirror. You know, forget about Nevada and forget about Super Tuesday coming up. This is just where we reside right now in in the world, and and I, you know, what? I'm kind of surprised that uh, Vice Chair Richard Clarida. Because this is his strength. This is what he's been writing about as far as dollar funding issues and the role of the dollar as a reserve currency. There is, this is serious. Now, it may be early, and, you know, but they do have an issue with the dollar. And, and it's an issue. It's a serious issue. 
only because of the course the huge amount of debt that's been built up in dollar denominated debt, which is I think twelve trillion. Uh, that's a lot, and as the dollar goes higher, it doesn't get any, uh, easier. For, uh, Ira, apparently, for apparently there's cash available in the repo market, but not at these low rates. They want higher rates. So then of you say, you yeah, right, yeah, and then, and then and then you say, okay, you got risk parity trades, the quant strategies that all rely on leverage, right, and and right. The repo markets for funding. Right. If if there's any kind of unwind there, right, because of higher rates and thus it puts pressure on their quant strategies, um, yeah. you know, that, that could get ugly real fast. Oh, oh, yeah. You know, now everybody's still in a very, the, uh, the Minsky mode of complacency or the anti-Minsky uh, dictum. So, yeah, you know, whatever. Whatever. Um, you can see the complacency for sure. Oh, there's no question. Listen, when I saw that the, that, the, that the S&P stayed like eight handles higher yesterday, I, I was honestly, you know, all morning, I go, wait a minute. I'm seeing all this stuff. And there was a, a headline out. Well, it wasn't a headline, but I talked to my uh, infectious disease expert who told me there were 35 deaths in Afghanistan from pneumonia. Now the Afghanis were saying, denying that it had anything to do with coronavirus, but out of the 35, 15 were kids, which was also something new. But uh, the story really hasn't been uh, gone beyond that. So uh, again, uh, not verified and there's a lot of uh, known unknowns, but unknown knowns. Uh, it's not, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult, board right now and the complacency and believe me uh they're buying dips the market is still you know this is just a buying opportunity we'll see and then of course we had trump's which has been rescinded about the, supposedly that he was going to stop the sale of ge uh plane engines to china that i guess is uh been rolled back, uh, or he never said it. I, I'm not sure. You know, it's a um, very active news. Uh, so, I, I mean, all these things are existing out there. But I, but I think right now, the Fed has to be concerned about the strength of the dollar. Hello, Ira. This is uh, David from Czech Republic. Oh, from the Czech Republic. Uh, good, good morning to you, sir. Your, uh, your, your question from yesterday, Ira. Oh, let me. Oh, good, David. Let, I have it. Yeah, I didn't. I still have it. So let's talk about that. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you about Japan. You 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 used to say a lot that uh, Jap Japan is a uh, uh, canary in the coal mine, and now with this uh, yeah. GDP slump, do you think it's starting, or uh, what's your take on this? You know, David, here, I, let me go to the question because I do have it exactly as it was written to me yesterday. Um, uh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, from David Manasan. Uh, Manasan? Is that your name? Yes, how, yes, how do I yes. say your last name? Yeah, okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. I, I go back to 1968. I was a big fan of the Czech uh, rebellion. Uh, oh. Um, uh, okay. You suggest that Japan is a canary in the coal mine. What is at stake on the GDP slump? Okay. The slump was, of course, due to what is one of the real uh, rules of economics that holds sway, which is people ran out ahead of the uh, 10% sale, of the rise in the sales tax to 10% and, and loaded up before the tax took took place. So you borrowed from the future from future demand ahead of the tax increase. And that was the, responsible for the biggest part of the downturn. Uh, but and that was I don't know that it was going to be that big, but it was is expected because every time the Japanese have done this where they've raised um, sales taxes, uh they've run into the same thing where they do it in order to placate the bond market because they're running too much debt and they're trying to get their budget under more control. And every time the same thing happens, you get 
a rush to buy things, and then the slowdown takes place and they don't recover from it. I think with this one, they were hoping that, uh, especially once the Olympics, you know, started, Japan started gearing up for the Olympics and all the tourism, and tourism has been climbing in Japan because uh, the currency has been, you know, relatively stable, uh, especially for the end, because the end is you know, prone to, to pre movements. So we're still sitting here basically at a 109, we're in a range of 108 to 110, 111 for the most part. So that's been pretty stable. And they were, I think, hoping that they would be able to recover some of that uh, lost uh, purchasing through foreign visitors and, of course, the coming Olympics. But that may be all thrown into um, uh, disarray because of the coronavirus. You know, we just don't know. As we said, it's too early. So it's a, it's a good question, David, and it is. The, the Japanese can, it will, I certainly look to them because when they start to slow, especially with their, uh, with their uh, high level machine orders, which are volatile uh, uh, data point, but this bears watching. And there was some rumblings over, you know, over the weekend about it, you know, that Abe was in a more difficult position. I, I don't think that's true from what I understand. Um, uh, uh, and I talked to my son, who actually has a, uh, a biography coming out about Abe uh, pretty soon. I don't know the exact date, but uh, he's not. He, listen, he he's strong, and so there's not that pressure yet. We'll see what takes place, you know, with, with the spread of this virus. But I think it, that downturn was was totally due to the uh, increase in uh, sales tax. And people are getting ahead of it. And again, you know, that's, you know, you, you can bring, that's what happens when people know there's going to be uh, an economic event, higher tax rates, lower tax rates. You know, they, they respond to it in real time. And what happens in the future has been affected by what they did in real time. Yeah. Uh, the the term for it in, in for a lot of for a lot of economic studies that I've read is Ricard, is Ricardian equivalence. So in a very simplistic way, if I know my property taxes are going up X amount, I'm going to save or put away money because I know I have a a future um, call on my revenue uh, on my uh, assets. So I have to be prepared for it. So it, it will affect how I in fact spend my money on other things. So that's what I think we're seeing here. And it's a good question, David. I just, I think it's too early to come up with that, to, to come to that point. But you, but I, I really appreciate that you know that I, I look at Japan in many ways as a very important uh, barometer. Uh, of course, they've been in this mess for um, longer than I care to admit. And I think they've made a mistake by prolonging some of this Far more than uh, than need be, but uh, I, I I think it's too early to make that call. I, I think it's really that downturn was uh, on an annualized basis six point three percent, but I think that was totally in in response and pretty much expected to the um, to the tax increase. Ira, did you check out uh, Japan's GDP deflator private consumption numbers from last night? From last night, I looked at them. But again, I was hold no, on from the was, from the fourth quarter. Yeah, I know. Hold on. Yeah, so not pretty. Uh, yeah, so I, huh? Yeah, no, not pretty. Not pretty. You're being kind. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Angelo just well, put, had me put up a chart, Ira, which is the EWJ. Yeah. And uh, it opened, uh, the ETF started trading in 96. Of course, the Nikkei goes back a lot farther. But right. it just failed at the opening range again. Yeah. Well, you look at it, and it's down, and that's with the yen. So David's <laughs> point even becomes, so let's talk about it. Let's go back to David's point. The yen's not even stronger today. And the Nikkei, you know, usually you get that correlation with if the yen actually is deemed to be somewhat of a safe haven. And, and you know what? 
the standard of the yen being a safe haven is because the Japanese have so much capital invested around the world. They're almost like the Brits in the 19, in the 19th century. They had so much capital that their ability to bring money home when they get nervous is huge. I mean, that's truly, it's just invested all over. So that's why you see that reflex, you know, as Soros would call it, the reflex action is, is really like perfect there. But see, and, and David's point then becomes even that much more important because you have the Nikkei down and the end, the end is not stronger. The end is not stronger. So it's something to watch and pay attention to. But as I say, it's not stronger. And this is more, again, because of the dollar, if we put up the Euro yen, this has hurt a lot of, you know, because it looked like, you know, well, uh, you know, when the reflation trade was on the first two weeks of the year, we see the, the Euro yen was following it perfectly. Okay, Judd, put it up. Yeah, I am. I was just, I just had the Nikkei up. I put a life of uh, fib on there and it's failing yep. at the half again. But, but you see that Euro yen, Euro oh. yen was, was marrying the inflation because, okay, you know, if I'm getting more aggressive, I think commodity prices, like we thought going into the new year, and, and it certainly showed in the first two weeks of the year, that, hey, we're going into a little bit of a ref reflation scenario. Uh, look at what that did. As soon as that got pulled back, that has mirrored everything else very well. Ira, you picked up on the yen today. What's the what's the Swiss franc doing? Swiss is is weak against the dollar. And there's a reason why I'm asking. You know, go uh, okay. Wait, let me let's talk in real terms. Though. The euro Swiss is on dramatic lows, and I'm glad you bring this up because we're down to 106.20 on the euro Swiss cross. And the reason this area becomes important is we go back to January of 2015, okay, when when havoc was un, uh, unleashed on all the mar on all the currency markets, and you had the uh, uh, SNB pull the plug on the peg, which caused the Swiss to rally dramatically. So if you look at it on a weekly chart, okay. So, you know, after the dramatic act price action, which was very dramatic, and, and people were busy absorbing these massive losses because there were a lot of people who were short Swiss on a carry trade basis, and they were funding all these mortgages in Eastern Europe. If Dave's there, he'll tell you, uh, Czechoslovakia, Poland, there were a lot of people borrowing in Swiss francs, and they got whacked pretty hard because when you borrow in Swiss francs, and it's okay to keep interest rates. And as long as the currency doesn't do anything, you're okay. But when the currency makes a 30% move upward, yeah, it's, you're saddled with, with a big hit. In fact, lawsuits are still being settled. Okay. But if we look at the four weeks in that period, because it takes a little while for the markets to clear itself, the, the big areas were in this 106 to 108 area. Um, Yes, uh, what was the, the low after yeah. that was? Yeah, I, I mean, so if we got down underneath 103, this would be very dangerous, and you'd have to watch the Swiss, because this would be dangerous, and the Swiss are trying to do as much as they can to prevent the uh, Swiss rank from, um, from uh, rallying, because they're worried about, again, the deflationary impact from a stronger Swiss franc on the Swiss economy. And that's with them printing money left, right, and center. Of course, they don't do what others do. They buy equities. So, as you know, we've talked about this probably six, seven months ago. I said I was no longer looking to short the Swiss, but that's not necessarily true. But the Swiss has gained dramatically against the uh, euro during that time period. So uh, it was much better to be short to be long gold and short euro than it was to be my favorite, which was long gold and short Swiss. Um, but you see what's happening here. And this is another one of those barometers. So it's a very good question. Who asked that, Angela? Yeah. Well, 
I'm, I'm, I'm completely pulling this out of my butt, Ira, but I was just thinking, you know, when you start, when you mentioned the weakness of the yen today, I was like, okay, weak yen, uh, is the Swiss franc showing any weakness? If the answer is yes, you know, obviously it's dependent upon, you know, who it's weak against, but, you know, could this be the very early stages of, of the market sniffing out uh, you know, this extended rally in stocks, overvalued, and starting to say, you know what, uh, we need to get out of Dodge because these central banks, you know, have spent a lot of printed money on, on equities. No, the, yeah, but, but spending it on equities is not necessarily a bad thing because at least you have an, a real asset uh, to to support it, and the market was willing to take your currency for some reason, even as you kept printing it. Again, the greatest feat of alchemy in 2,000 years. Um, but you're sitting and riding pretty high right now because, well, unless equity markets collapse, but I'm not saying that they're going to collapse. And you know what? I wonder what their average uh, buy on Apple was, you know, because they own billions upon billions in Apple stock. So they've done pretty well. And it, the problem is if they sell, they're in a difficult situation because then they put more upward pressure on the Swiss franc because whatever they sell, if it's dollar denominated, then you, unless you hold those dollars, which I don't think that they'll want to, uh, you have to get – you're going to start buying in some of the massive amounts of Swiss francs you've printed. So they're in, a, they're in a very difficult situation. They have the ability to exit far better than any other central bank, but uh, it's still wrought with, uh, with all types of uh, dangers. Yeah, that, that was sort of my point, you know, like who sells yeah. first, the central banks or the algos? Yeah, well, you know, and, and, and then and then the feeding frenzy. You know, you well, get the the Swiss just stalling out against some major moving averages, and all that's happening is is that you know you're getting this little lift in the Swiss and the euro, but the gold and silver are rallying far faster. Oh yeah, that's it, listen, the silver. I'm a little pissed at myself right now because that silver is really. Yeah, we looked it, at it, well, this morning uh, outside of Versal yeah. Day, some of those names. Yeah, well, and, you know, there was a piece by, and let's talk about this, Andrew Heck. Does anybody read Andrew Heck? He, he appears in Seeking Alpha, and he wrote a piece over the weekend about how J.P. Morgan was manipulating the silver market. Anybody read that piece? I didn't see it. No, I didn't okay. see it. I know the topic well, I think. Yeah, but Andrew Heck is he's he's a pretty good analyst. I like to read but a few guys sent it to me and said, What do you think about this? First of all, I'm not buying it. Because my response to them is look it. The hunt cornered the silver market in nineteen eighty, nineteen seventy nine, eighty, seventy eight, seventy nine, eighty, with a billion in assets. Okay. Hell, there's fifty funds out there with ten to 50 times that much in assets. So if they really, if somebody really felt that JP Morgan was manipulating that, if I had a $10 billion fund and I thought that was the case, I'd go right after them. Okay, let's, let's go. Let's go head to head because I know with my leverage, I can do whatever you can. And at some point, as we saw with the London whale, when the losses start to pile up, I'm going to push at you. So, you know, I just don't buy. I don't buy it. Guys like Druckenmiller and um, uh, Kovner and Tudor and Gunlatch, if they really thought, and it would be a very vulnerable spot uh, for them to attack J.P. Morgan and push it, and you know, nothing gets a bull market going than shorts covering. So. There's enough big money players out there. I just don't believe it. I just think that the silver has been uh, the, uh, one of the hedge vehicles. So, you know, when, when people think the economy is really going to take off, they buy copper, they sell silver. Uh, the, I think probably the gold, you know, because we've seen the gold-silver ratio at levels to me that make no sense based on what I see around the world. 
but they do make sense when you understand that the central banks are buying a lot of gold to build up the reserves. So you have gold being taken out of the system, being taken out of the lending system. Yeah, it's it's just being uh, stashed away in certain central banks. We know the Russians are buying. We know the Indians are buying. We know that the Chinese are buying and other central banks. So there is gold. And I think when I step back and take a look, that's one of the reasons why the gold-silver ratio, you know, last night was at 89 and a half, or yesterday morning, 89 and a half. Um, now it has room to run on a historical basis. You know, that's one of my favorite all-time uh, things that I learned to love as an indicator. Uh, and it's worth, and it's broken a lot of hearts. And, and a lot of people who are traders of this, of this relationship have really, because they've all been looking for this silver rally, you know, especially, yeah, you could see it when we, when we had a sense again, that we were going to get some reflation trade, it, you know, it, it actually started, uh, silver started outperforming. And then, you know, as soon as uh, we had fears of a demand shock and possible uh, deflation, starting the second, uh, third week of January, gold really outperformed. And again, I think that has to do with the banks, the big banks, the big wealth funds taking more gold out of the market. Um, but if, you know, again, you're really not going to get a huge metals rally unless silver, silver historically has led the way because it's a much more volatile. All you do is have to look at options pricing. Silver is much more volatile and it is prone to, uh, to uh, very, very aggressive rallies. We just haven't seen one in a while. And I think it's because as people have bought in some assets or they're quick to sell, same with, you know, the same with what they've done with platinum. You know, it, it, there's a lot of hedge. And when I say hedge, I mean just uh, they, they buy the strongest and sell the weakest. And that that's uh, an old uh, trader's uh, viewpoint. On the, you know, and you know, everybody who listens in this room, I'm a relative value person. I seek relative value all over the globe. That's my strength. That's what I bring. That's, that's what I know. So always on the lookout to see where that's taking place. But silver is, you know, as I said, I, I really, I had my biggest position in silver on uh, actually going home on Friday, which was unusual because I don't like to do it in front of these presidents day weekends. But, you know, I was playing with the gold silver ratio uh, if it was all clear. And, and the ideal trade, of course, was to sell the S&Ps against it, by the way, which I did have on, but I didn't stay that long enough because I said, well, okay, if it all collapses and the silver loses its luster as a precious metal and we're back to industrial, it's okay. The S and P's will provide the protection for it. So, I mean, that's my thought process and the way I, I see it. Um, but Aaron, just to put a yeah. finer point on that, uh, yeah. silver has underperformed gold over the last 12 months by 600 basis points. Yeah. Okay. And, and you know what? I, I laugh about it because when I read the uh, J.P. Morgan stuff, and again, go find the Andrew Heck piece, you know, and I always cite this. Anytime that the Chinese, and if, I, and if I ran the People's Bank of China and I was looking for a speculative play, yeah, I would just start putting out headlines that, uh, you know, maybe we're going to be buying that. We're, gonna, we're not only going to have gold reserves, we're going to have a lot of silver reserves. Watch what happens. And, and that's not unusual, by the way. Because remember, in the 1800s, China was on the silver standard. Oh, that and would was, be a hoot. And, and it was the Boxer Rebellion and the Opium Wars. We got, Is Mike on? I think the U.S. was on a silver standard earlier in the 1800s. Bimetallism in the U.S. Bimetallism. And that was oh, yeah, you know, the it. famous... Okay. And that was the famous speech in 1896 at the Democratic Convention. Williams, Jenny, Bryan, you know, I will not be crucified on a cross of gold. And farmers, you know, it's the same divide that exists right now. All the people who voted, the Trump voters, were bimetallists. They wanted inflation. <laughs> that sounds, we don't get away from this, do we? But farmers who are, who are heavily, always heavy in debt, borrowing, 
for machinery, for land, for uh, to plant the next year crop. They liked bimetallism because it ensured uh, some sense of inflation in the system. You can the William Jennings speech, 1896, one of the great speeches in American uh, history. But it's bimetallism, and we were up until 1964. All the coins in my pocket were silver. People made fortunes after they they stopped issuing uh, silver coins because there were dimes, quarters. Uh, half dollars and dollars, and and they were buying them. They were paying a dollar thirty-five for 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 four quarters. I can remember the signs. I can remember uh, my dad had bought some coins, and I'm walking down Madison by Canal Street, carrying two big bags of silver coins, <laughs> and somebody said, "Are you crazy?" I said, "What?" They said, you're going to get robbed. Yeah, not bad. I was going to Lou Mitchell's to pay for breakfast. Um, but we were, we were bimetallists. But if Mike is in, he'll tell you that the Boxer Rebellion and the Opium Wars were all about Britain punishing the, the Chinese and pushing for the depreciation of silver in order to really harm the Chinese. Do we have Mike? Mike, are you here? Ah. See, I, he's, I think he's in, or it's a different one. So okay. I can't tell. Right. Well, yeah, but the Chinese, you know, that's still a big part of their history. Oh. And so I, 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 okay, so I, I wait for the day when the Chinese give us a bimetallist um, discussion which would actually make a lot of people in the U.S. happy, like the MMT crowd, because it would be a historical context, but, it would be, but they would find a lot of um, impetus in that, because again, it'd be, not that we're on the gold standard, we're not, but just the whole concept of it. Uh, wow, you know, a central bank like China, a sovereign wealth fund like the Norwegians or the Russians, they could, they could do this in a minute. So when I read, I'm always, and I'm, I'm not saying that anybody should do this, but when I read about J.P. Morgan, if J.P. Morgan, as Andrew Heck writes about and others have, have pushed the discussion, and Andrew Heck's discussion is a very high-level discussion. It's not nonsense. It's not, you know, it just talks about it. But, you know, my, my answer would be, hey, let me run a fund for what? Let me run the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund for a week, or the Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund. I promise you, I'll have silver up to forty dollars in a week. Promise. So, it, I don't think it would behoove J.P. Morgan. Yeah, you know they may be spoofing it, although people have to be very careful. It's not like you know eight nine years ago. So if you and I don't like the spoofing stuff. I'm always been opposed to it any more than I like iceberg orders in the market. I can't stand those. You got an order, put it out there, because anybody who's a floor trader will tell you the market comes to size. It doesn't run away from size. That's a myth. The market comes to size. Anytime I had a 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 order to fill, I put it out there. You know why? Because what was referred to in bonfires of the vanity as a big swinging dicks, they're coming for the order. Oh, yeah. So we, we, right, Joe? we were just talking about that today. Yeah, here. I, I, I want to I read you Michael's comment here because he's listening. He can't talk. One, okay. uh, Anne Marie said she read that article. Uh, Michael said, Chinese government is, is experimenting with UMI and Hanju, universal minimum income. They are giving out 20K for medical care staff to spend citywide. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's like a bounty to work in a dangerous job, I guess. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, uh, uh, Ira. Uh, yes. Isn't since physical since physical delivery isn't isn't a reality in those those precious metals futures markets? Why not? They're, they're like weird, well, right? No, you can get delivery. 
Well, then, then I, 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 I don't know. The way I read it, I, you can get it, but you can't. The, the open interest in the futures contrast is way out of scale with what's avail any time available well, in physical but, delivery. Peter, they don't want what? you to take delivery through the clearing house, houses. They don't want to deal with it. I know they don't, but, uh, but well, the point is that the futures market is trading on a whole different, not, not, it's not tethered to the realities of the physical market. Yeah, you know, and, and one, of my, you know, one of my mentors who taught me a lot, Jim Sinclair, has written a lot about this. And, uh, you know, Jim picks up the blog a lot. And we actually talk every once in a while or email. Uh, you know, he's been on this, you know, about uh, paper, uh, that you should have your money in physical yeah, I'm not sure. I'm a trader, so I, I look to trade it. Now, that's been going on a long time, of course, because a lot of funds, including, I think, some of the ETFs, you know, they hedge themselves by being long the, the uh, futures contract. Now, you can take delivery. And believe me, Judd's judge right. Because I hear uh, March, Sil March Silver... So first notice day will probably be what? Uh, February 28th, which means that, it, or 29th, because leap year. But if I'm long, I can possibly be delivered upon, okay? Or short, because that's- well, the, short, the short seller has to deliver the physical if somebody called it, right? If somebody calls it, yeah. Well, or, that's, that's where or somebody they, could, could screw JP Morgan, because well, their, well, they their can position's also, way beyond what they could ever get in the physical market. I could also deliver on somebody who's long, by the way. Yeah, right. You give it to them. Okay, so that's that's what the clearinghouses don't don't want it because there there's. But I guarantee you, if I was enormous enough fund with enough money behind me, there's not a clearinghouse that's going to tell me no, don't do that. I, oh yeah, I'm taking delivery of two billion dollars worth of silver. Okay, this is all hypothetical, and I'm not suggesting. But I'm, but I know that this exists out there because we've seen it. It's it's only 40 years ago that the Hunts did this, and again with a billion. Because when you start to apply the leverage, now could they could the CFTC put an end to it? Absolutely. Could the SEC get involved? Absolutely. But the ability to wreak havoc is great. And I'm not talking conspiratorial whether the silver is there or not. Because let me tell you something. What Mark Rich used to do with copper and other things, is they just used to move the warehouse receipts or they would actually move the metal from the, the COMEX warehouse to the London warehouse. And then all of a sudden it would show up, oh, uh, uh, COMEX stocks, uh, you know, uh, actual stocks dropped dramatically. And then you'd only find them that they'd just been moved to the London. So there were really no change in the supply and demand it was just the location of it. This was actually going on too, I believe, in the, in like 2000, you know, during the great financial crisis, when there were issues of collateral and Goldman Sachs had warehouses that they were, you know, warehousing metals for certain clients. And they were well behind from the people who were taking it down. And it provided a problem because a lot of that stuff get, gets lent out. And they were making, there was a place in Detroit, I think, for copper, at a copper warehouse, you know, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but I'm pretty sure that was the case. And there was some real fears that there was not going to be enough supply, actual physical supply. So this is the world we live in. And yet it's not as creative as, you know, as I've seen with onions, potatoes, and silver through my life. Um, you do start, to, well, we saw it with the lumber market too at certain times. People would move uh, actual physical supply around in order to try to affect the uh, mindset of the markets. But I, again, read the Andrew Heck, the, who, who is that? Who, who was that Anne Marie? Who I read, it? Who read that? Read it. Yeah, and what, what was her feeling? I don't know, she hasn't told me. I think she's just listening. Oh. She can she's type just, she's, she wants or she can she's, chime in. Anne Marie is teasing us. But what, I, want her, I want her opinion because she's, she's got a good eye and she's very, uh, unlike, unlike the males in this room, she's not as emotional. So she'll give us a much more. Not as a passionate, <laughs> passionate. 
No, no. Emotional. I've talked to her. She's not. <laughs> nice, very Peter. Me- very, me- very measured. Yeah, she Come is. On, very measured and very don't smart. Hold- Come on, Don't Anne-Marie. hold back. Come on. You're Roman. Come on in. Uh, <clears throat> you're going to need a like a 46 and a half print in the S&Ps to confirm a near-term high here. She's not biting, Ira. She, I, I don't want. She, I just want to know her opinion. I know. Well, she's either tied up or she's not typing it in so far. Okay. All right. We'll we'll get it from her. But I mean, he's, all this stuff is going on. It's and it, the piece was interesting. I mean, he posted it. it was on uh, Seeking Alpha, so it's out there. And he, and he does. He writes well, and he has a really deep knowledge uh, of the markets. Hey, I just wanted to judge for a little update on the what's going on with the SPU. It took out that level you talked yeah, about. It's a bye-bye. It's 46 and a half is the next level I'm looking at. And that confirms a... Uh, um, it's a 50. That's the reversal on the 50. What was, Judd, what was the level that you were talking about before? 57, 58? Well, under 65 and a quarter, it's done. Yeah, that was the OR. Yeah, that was and, the OR. And, and, and below 88 in the NASDAQ, and the NASDAQ's still hanging on to it. Yeah, NASDAQ is still above its opening range. The S&P me <clears> a yeah, nice well, day it's, here. It's Shopify, uh, Amazon, uh, you know, just a few names. But, I mean, most of the financials have just gotten torched. And uh, it's just instrument-specific. And, and and Microsoft's still hanging up, and people really haven't started selling Apple yet. So it just got priced lower. Now, has- excluding the Solomon missile, I mean, it's it's really a all new high for its highest high it's put in for years. What's going on? What's going on today? Which one? Gold. I'm just saying gold. Well, and, and- well gold's, you know, gold's breaking out. Gold's very okay. breaking out on, on the 100 by, by 3. Well, I I think in the very beginning, Peter, in the very beginning of our conversation, you know, that was the first thing that I kind of asked Iron. The first thing he said was, you know, gold is not, it's not reacting to the, to the equities or to the dollar, really. It's, it's, it's right now, this is a hedge. Everybody who's long, uh, tentative, not tentatively, yeah, maybe tentatively is a good word, you know, kind of nervous about their longs are hedging themselves with the metals. Look at, you know, (coughs) um, platinum to palladium to silver to gold. And the 30 year bonds. Just about so, uh, right. Merv, Merv once has a comment here. It says, is gold hinting at a Fed rate cut? And there's also lots of call buying in VIX. And the FANG names, he says, are behaving like bonds given toll free they charge, fee they charge for non physical service. That's a, oh, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, good point, Merv. Mm-hmm. The toll fee, the the toll fee they charge for non physical service. Yeah, they don't have to have any inventory. They have to sell or make or anything. Yeah, it's interesting to me too. This is, but you're seeing it, and it. This is. I'm telling you, they're making a mistake here. I said it weeks ago, and and the metals smell it, and they're going to push at them and go, hey, again, it's not about uh inflation okay can we can we take that away off the table can we take it away it's yeah. not about inflation <laughs> yeah this i mean is- judd i mean ira if you look at if you look at a, a historical chart of, of gold going way back i think yep. you'll notice that its best performance comes during deflationary times no no question because again mm-hmm. it's a fiat currency world if we were on a gold standard I would tell you differently. Then it would be inflation, because that's what because the interest rates would have to go up. Da da da. You're in a fiat currency world. If you don't understand that difference, then you know what? Just keep trading equities. But you're trading that based on a fiat currency world too, by the way. So, and and that implies what central bank policy is going to do, because that's what. That's what the whole basis of a fiat currency world is. It's 
Fiat currencies are based on the credibility and responsibility of any government issuing money. That's all. Don't look at Argentina. Really? Do you, do you trust the credibility of the Argentinian uh, financial system? No. 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 no so you not. search for no. assets. All right. So here's here's a uh, and tell me if uh, I'm off base and I'm sure you will. But so uh, could this rally in gold, which obviously is is a head, well, you know, and we've talked about this for a long time, is a hedge against the Fed and you know, it, well, the 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 U.S. fiat currency uh, and the Fed and, and other central banks losing control of of uh, monetary policy. Could the rally in 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 the metals also be sort of an indictment? that the left would be looking for on Trump's policies? No, too that early is, in, my, okay. in, my, in my estimation, because that's a, that's a bet if you make, that's not a hedge, you're making a bet. And if you make that okay. bet, yeah, I think you, you, you're, you're early. I can, make, I can find other ways to do that if we really put our heads together without that type of risk. just popped into my mind. There was one other uh, thought that, I, that popped into my mind too earlier when you were talking about the Hunt brothers. Most traders have no, most traders nowadays uh, don't look at, don't have historical data. If they have historical data, it's going back five, six years, uh, let alone having any idea about the Plaza Accords or about the Hunt brothers cornering silver or anything like that. So understanding mm -hmm. the history of the markets and you know, obviously this is something that I've learned from you and Judd and, and, and you know, my mentor, you two, and along the way of my career is, you know, we have to know where we've been to understand where we're going. So look at, looking at historical charts, but not just historical charts, reading about historical actions and reactions from those that control the markets, you know, uh, like the Hunt brothers with a billion dollars underneath management um, and these huge funds nowadays that if they really truly wanted to manipulate the price of silver, they could. So it's just understanding the history, not only of, of the historical charts, but understanding the history of, of, of what has affected the, the, the price of the value of our fiat currency in the last, what, 40 odd years, you know, since the, the Nixon took us off what was left of the gold standard. Yeah. I don't know if yeah, that's well, making August, sense. But. August, August 15th, 1971. Not that it wasn't already. You don't need hard dates, honestly. Yes, I can yeah. give you the hard data of, of the Swiss doing it. And again, nuance and context, right? Always. Hey, I, you know, I, I really, it, it, and I was talking about this with Richard Benugli this morning. You know, some of this stuff, you, it, you get irritated because I can honestly say, and I have the blog to prove it, and two hits with Santelli that I talked about the coming pulling of the peg by the Swiss National Bank a month before it happened by looking at charts. And you can go back and look at that chart. And people say, oh, nobody saw that. I go, that's wrong. And that doesn't mean you always get it right. But there are things afoot. There's so much damn liquidity chasing around the world and looking for things to do. I'm telling you, if I had a $10 billion fund, I, I'd, make it, I'd be printing Carson City silver dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so you know listen again Pax Angela Judd and everybody in this room all I keep talking about is nuance and context and that's what we're discussing today because out of the context you context you begin to understand some of the nuance and that doesn't mean that silver might not break 50 cents by the end of the day if the S and P's rally, because you know we'll, we'll get a headline, you know the, the uh, coronavirus, you know deaths are 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 are, are falling, uh, cases are falling, and the market will, it still doesn't change where the situation is going to be. And again, you know my my concern is about a demand shock and the way that banks are going to respond to it. Look at. The Asian contagion of 1997 and 1998, when Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, we'll go through them all. That was a that was that was not that was a, a supply shock in the fact that there was just too much capacity. 
as the Chinese began stealing everybody's market share because they could, as I wrote about on Sunday with the, you know, the devaluation of the yuan on January 1st, 1994, you know, the, the devaluation that happened by, you know, pure accident, you know, of course, uh, cynicism intended, uh, all that capacity that had been built in those countries and with, with all that borrowing, and you're facing this situation right now, by the way, because you have a lot of capacity. And if demand starts to dry up because people just are not spending because they're fearful about where this virus is going, you're gonna, you have a lot of excess capacity that is going to drive prices lower. You drive prices lower combined with a stronger dollar, uh-oh, you know, it's you know, funny. You know, it's just struck me something that you said is, you know, the business cycle. How many investors out here don't even understand that? They're, they're these, these novices and these millennials, they don't even understand the business cycle, and the Fed has suspended it. But you're bringing up a great point. You know, there there there's so much overcapacity out there, uh, and and they need cash flow and they have debt. That's that's a hell of a toxic brew, waiting to be unleashed. What? But people don't get that always. They don't get it. They they don't even know that. If everybody who entered the investment world for the first time since 2009, they probably don't know anything about that. You you know, and I know it's Peter, right, Peter? Yeah, it is, yeah. Okay. And you know what? Fellow UW alum. That's right, baby. You got it. So so that's the strength. You know, my, my background is steeped in the Austrian and Marxist school. That's what I studied. You know, I would go back and forth between Hayek, Schumpeter, and Marx. That's what I understood. But that gives me that context. You know what? And Keynes understood it, too. Keynes gets a bad rap. I, I'm not a, you know, there were some things. But he's been so prostituted. Because, again, when Nixon famously said, we're all Keynesians now, he understood. I could spend deficit, but that's not what Keynes said. During good times, you're supposed to run budget surpluses. So that the government can act as a contravailing force during downturns of the business cycle. So as long as we're talking cycles, you know, Schumpeter wrote two massive volumes on the business cycles uh, that some of it is over my head, but a lot of it you know, that I've read is fascinating. You, you haven't put the, see the fed wants to believe that whole concept of the neo Keynesians in the seventies and eighties, with being able to fine tune that. And that's what they strive for to fine tune. But again, it all depends what you're looking at. It all depends what you're looking at. And no, I, I don't think that they've put the business cycle to rest. And Pete, you make that it is absolutely from the Austrian school. You borrow, that's what capitalists are supposed to do. They borrow money to, uh, uh, as an entrepreneur, the animal spirits to create some type of business, a factory, they do this, they do that, they create software. And then they're making their profit margins are high. Everybody says, wow, those margins are high. I'm going to get into that business and they drive margins down. You wind up with excess capacity. People borrow too much money. Uh, they can no longer make profits. They have to pay. They, they, they default on their debt. The, the businesses get sold off, foreclosed, whatever. And that's the creative destruction that Schumpeter talked about. It's, I know that it gets complex within it, but when you think about it in that turn, and Pete, you're doing, you, you really did everybody a service, that exists. I'm a capitalist. But I'm a capitalist with an Austrian and, and Marxist pedigree. Yeah, let me because just to clarify he, to people, Marx, Marx described the business cycle you know, quite well, especially for his time. It's just that yeah. he, twist, he twisted it into all kinds of political agendas, the conclusions, but he did a good, guy, good no, job describing it. Look at, I, if you want to understand anything, read the critics. You know, I, you know, I used to anger my Marxist friends by saying that, you know, Karl Marx was a, was a bourgeois apologist. You know, that would get me, uh, <laughs> I would get beat upon physically and emotionally, but that's okay. Well, nowadays they it. would nowadays they would uh, just scratch you for saying shit like that. So yeah, I know, I know, I know. I, I won't make Bernie's economic team, although I could be a good fit there. But 
when, when you want to understand something, read the critics. See, that's the problem in the world in which we live in. Everybody only wants validation. Me, I want discourse, and I want to read those who disagree with me. That's where I start every day. And as, you know, the readers, as you guys, as guys who listen to podcasts, I read copious amounts of, of stuff, but I always agree. I always read with those who I know are going to disagree with me. Always. You know, if I think that they have, you know, if I hold them in high enough esteem where I think that they're good. And, but I always, you know, I read Stiglitz. I, and I just, you know, some things we'll agree upon. Other things we won't. But I have to look at that uh, perspective. Otherwise, I'm cheating myself. I'm cheating myself. But I think that's where we're at today. And I think the Fed is... They better they better be attentive because again, and I'm not saying it's an equity issue. I'm saying it's a dollar issue. I mean, you got to give the Chinese credit. I mean, they started pumping liquidity into the system rather quickly. You know, yeah. uh, what was it Sunday? Yeah. Sunday they announced that they were lowering taxes or eliminating corporate taxes. You know, now now we have the um, whoever mentioned the uh, twenty thousand per uh, per medical professional. China's going to keep doing stuff to try and, you know, stem the bleeding. Um, you know, oh, but yeah. who knows? Yeah, but well, you just can't get an honest, you can't get an honest answer. We're back, we're back to what, you know, I've always maintained. I don't bring, I don't believe any statistical data that comes out of China. I haven't, because as soon as they shut Google off, that was my mantra. No Google, I can't. You're not allowing the free flow of information. I can't, you know, and I know all these people study it from, you know, kilowatt hours burned and, you know, everybody's got their methodology. And, you know, I'm skeptical. You know, I have to deal with the data that is released, but a country of that size who always hits its bogey or within one-tenth of one percent, I'm skeptical. Um, and so never revises so the data. Never, no. Don't okay, you got, it, you, yeah. you got you got places in the country that you can only get to by ox cart. All right, but yeah. at the at the first at the minute the quarter closes, man, data's there. But yeah, yeah. The, the big new the big conversation was really out of Singapore over the weekend. It yeah, you're right, Judd. It's a, yeah, I agree. It was. Yeah, very important because there we we have much more faith in in the. Uh, in the transparency. Uh, but as I, when I was talking to my uh, infectious disease expert, he's getting, he's getting frustrated as are a lot of scientists in this country because the data is just all over the place. And some of it just, it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't compute with things that they've done. So, you know, that's why I put the warning and I, I, you know, I, you're going to go from headline to headline with coronavirus. Okay. I'm going to be slow to react. Sometimes slower is better, and this is one of those moments. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to uh, help. Appreciate it, Ira. Anything else? You know, really, if people would really, you know, and I appreciate Dave's question from uh, Prague or wherever he's at in Czechoslovakia, um, because, again, the questions will generate deeper discussion when you get when, when they come forward and i want to hear from Anne marie so uh because the fact that she read that article i you know I, I have a lot of respect for her and i i think she has a lot of wisdom so uh, i would like to have seen her perspective heard her perspective i should say well she's she, we're male dominated and, and she's yeah i know talking to us right now <laughs> it, it, it's interesting though as i'm sitting here and we're in our discussion I just got an email from somebody I haven't heard from who I, I used to get interviewed on uh, the closing bell in London, Europe's closing bell regularly. She's like one of my favorite journalists, Louisa Bolgensen. You guys know who she is? She was on CNBC and she did the closing bell in London when, when the London, when the European markets were closed and I would always do a lot of, I would, I did probably a weekly hit with her on, uh, on that, it was at 10.30 in the morning, and she was really good. I mean, in-depth knowledge of the global system. And she would always have me on with some other guests. Uh, one day I was on versus Wilbur Ross. 
Wow. Uh, oh, I, and, I'd love to see that. Yeah, I don't know if you can find it because again, it was London. No. Uh, so, so he thought I was the other Ira Harris. Oh, J. Ira. Huh? Yeah, J. Ira, and this was probably in 2012, 2013. This was after he spun out, you know, because he had invested in the Irish banks after the beginning of the crisis, maybe it was 2014. And, and we were talking, and now he was going to invest in Greece, and he was trying to squeeze the Greece um, uh, depositors, because he was buying uh, Greek banks and Greek uh, debt. And, uh, you know, I, I was pushing back going, no, this is, this is all wrong. There has to be some type of massive restructuring. And he was none too happy with me. But Louisa was laughing. She says, oh, I'm good. And he said to me at the break, he says, wait, you're not the other, you're not Jay Harris. I said, no, other one. And Louisa was laughing. But she just sent me an email. I haven't talked to her in years. So I got to find out what this is about because she's retired from CNBC. Uh, good. Well, I'll, get, I'll let you guys know. And tomorrow I'm having breakfast with Book Clark. Oh, cool. So if you want any questions, yeah, he's out here. He he comes out to Scottsdale. So we do this, and I'm not name dropping. I it's just because I'm, I'm going to have some of these discussions that I have in this room with Peter. I mean, it's a pleasure. Uh, well, you guys have to so, you know, come up with the questions beforehand, so we're not always on the fly. It makes yeah, better, yeah, better discipline. right. And it's not. Listen, we, you can ask him in real time too, because you know people say, "Well, you and Santelli used to prepare." I, I said, "Rick and I never." had a prep discussion in our lives. He would read the blog or he would know what my strengths were. You know, I go, that's all on the fly. And we can do it in this room on the fly. I mean, my work is done regardless. And if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. Or if I don't have an opinion, I'll tell you. I, I haven't thought about it. But if you awaken it in me, maybe we can, you know, come to them together, which is always the best because that's really, again, what this is all about. It strengthens everybody. All right. Well, thanks, Ira. Appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. And yeah. David, thanks, Ira. Dave from Czechoslovakia, thank you for the uh, question and keep them coming. You, and Judd, if Anne Marie comes in, I want the answer. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thanks. Okay. <laughs>